got the correct version of what you call it. So yes. Oh, that found. So yes. frequencies that all this stuff is set up on that now there's so many with cell phones and everything else there's so many competing bandwidths that are walking on top of each other that honestly and truly short of us doing about a fifty thousand dollar upgrade to the sound system you're stuck with some of these glitches from time to time because when i've only got about 30 or 40 people Clicker's fine. Huh. So when, it's everybody's, our cell phones when everybody's got Wi Fi and everything else turned on on their phones and their data, huh. because it's it, it's not all the same frequencies. Different towers, different. Yeah. And so it's got, you know. Now, that, the main reason that continues to be a challenge is because people don't understand. Set it so that it, you're actually speaking, because the sensor won't pick up on it. If it's too low or it's too high, it yeah. only picks up as they change their head. Because huh. we finally got that one squared away. Yeah. We played with it and found a frequency that it could dial in on. But the clicker, it's it's one frequency that goes straight to the computer. And it doesn't always mesh up. So. I see you having trouble with it, and I hate it, but I don't know what the solution is. I was hoping you did. That's that's the best of the clickers. That is the best of the clickers. Huh. I've got three other ones, and they're both worse than that one, even though they're newer. Huh. So, yeah. Well, I do love the slides, so <laughs> pictures or whatever. But I do appreciate your, I do appreciate your desire. Yeah. I do, I do. Good morning. How are you? That's a bright color. That's beautiful. I think it's in the dark. Huh? <laughs> Not quite. <laughs> Tell us too much Somebody wondered, you know, I was in third grade before I figured out my name wasn't Michael Bailey. 
Good morning. Good morning. If you will, in the little book, number 516, 516, 516, to Christ be loyal and be true. We'll sing all three verses. Break to class. 516. Sing all three verses, be led in prayer, then break to class. To Christ be loyal and be true, he is banner beyond foe, and born aloft till is secured the conquest of the world. To the Lord be true, for he will go with you, and help you all your conflicts through, to Christ the Lord be true, to Christ be loyal and be true, he needs brave God and direct us and uh, through our classes, make us learn and uh, go through our day and help us through our life. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. amen.
He did. start a new quarter-ish, kind of want to do a little bit of a lead-in for where we will actually be this summer. Uh, after discussing it with the eldership, uh, we've opted that for Sunday mornings we're going to kind of take a basics of the faith, not from the standpoint of, I know many of you know, um, but we're going to look at some of the reason why every once in a while you need to have a basics of the faith class that's what we're going to do this morning so if you have your bible uh, we'll be looking at a variety of scriptures this morning on why this is important and i want to start with philippians 3 and verse 1 philippians 3 and verse 1 and sister jen if you have that in just a moment if you wouldn't mind reading it You know, in for how we do classes overall in most places in churches of Christ, in any given adult class especially, you run the spectrum of people who've been sitting there for 60 years and people who've been there for six weeks. And so because we just throw everyone in the same class, um, for those who were fans of uh, Little House on the Prairie, you know, they had like, you know, from 4 to 18 all in one room. Yeah. Well, that's great, kind of. Um, but when that's what, what you have in your Bible class and you only have people sometimes for one hour a week, you have to sometimes go back to the basics. One, for the people who are new to the faith so that they understand why are we doing what we do here. For people who've maybe come in from other places, that maybe how their congregation did it, how this congregation, etc. So that we understand what's the scriptural basis of what we do. And then also, for people who've been Christians for a long while, um, that maybe they think they know the word of God. Some of them don't know it as well as they think. They've been like, I've been coming to church for 50 years. Well, you ain't learned nothing. And I can blame it on all the preachers, but you're the only one in the whole church that's like this. All right? You say, you can't say that to people. Sure I can. Um, I try not to. You know, I try to be a little more diplomatic and say, well, I'm not sure how you missed the last 50 years of teaching, but, you know, we'll, we'll help you anyway. But the other part of it is, is sometimes if we haven't looked at something in a while, do we, and I say do we, I mean even myself included, are there times where maybe you get scriptures mixed up or maybe you've forgotten scriptures um, that maybe some things have drifted and maybe we're holding to something that that's not what scripture actually says. And so... You know, I, I know y'all think I come with trick questions all the time, but my biggest trick question is, what does the verse say? That's always my big trick question. What does the verse say? And so that's all those factors go into a fundamentals of the faith class. And if Sister Jen, if you'll read Philippians 3, 1, this is a crucial verse. <clears throat> My brethren, rejoice in the Lord. For me to write the same things to you is not tedious. Meaning it's not a burden on Paul to write the same things. But for you, it's safe. We live in an interesting age. Right? A preacher, we heard that gospel of John last year. Give us something exciting and new. Um, <clears throat> when you understand most of the quote Bible studies out there most of the video classes the DVD put any name of any high profile teacher on it you want 
What's the goal of all those? You say to help people learn their faith. Hmm. Money. It's money and marketing. I'll use one person. He's in San Antonio. His last, last name rhymes with Pucato. <laughs> In, 19, in the mid-1980s, when he did his first round of books through Howard Publishing Company out of West Monroe, Louisiana, all of his writing was geared towards mainstream moderates in the Churches of Christ. As he changed his target audience, his doctrine changed also. That by the time the early 90s came, he, on his radio program, would tell people, just invite Jesus into your heart while you drive. And then his church dropped of Christ from their name. And when Catherine and I lived in Texas, I saw where they had changed their stance on infant baptism and sprinkling. And I told Catherine, I said, He's fixing to go after the sprinklers. And the next year, Abingdon, which is the main publisher for the Methodists, picked him up as a main author. Because while they said that while we believe that baptism by full immersion is the scriptural pattern, we do not hinder you in your fellowship and salvation if you were sprinkled or poured. His doctrine changed as he needed a new audience to buy his product. And I can pick others. There's a Baptist lady. She was really conservative years ago. As she's tried to break away from the Baptist as her main target, she's broadened her spectrum. Her last name rhymes with the word chore. She used to have some real good stuff. And then most of the pastors in her denomination realized she was a better speaker than they were. And when she realized they were going against her, she started to change so she could market a different target audience. And you say, what does that have to do with this verse? Everyone is always wanting to hear something new, something different. Itching ears. That's right, Sister Phyllis. Brother, when are we going to come to church and hear something new? Off oh, you'll just come. You'll hear something new pretty much every week. Because you'll sit in this class and you go, I've never heard that before. But I've read the verse 973 times. How come I never connected it? Because as the word of God gets into your spirit, the spirit of God is able to make the word of God come alive to you as you meditate on it. Because then your words, his words, your thoughts, his thoughts start to be the same because you're getting yourself straightened out. Hence why it is safe to go over the word of God again and again and again and again. If the seed is the word of God. Why would you want to sow any other seed into the Lord's church? How many seeds does God have to make Christians and to build his church? It's not a trick question. One, his word. If it is only through the engrafted word that he saved souls in obedience to that word. Anything else takes you from it. And so it's safe. It's safe to go back through the word of God again and again and again. And for those who have been doing the Bible reading have been reading it out loud for others of you that you know you discovered Alexander Scorby. Man, if you if you say who Alexander Alexander Scorby. Yeah, this is one of the few things I'll recommend other than your quote Bible. 
because it's just some dude with this absolutely beautiful baritone voice that is a trained Shakespearean actor and that the bulk of his life's work was narrating books for the blind. So you'll, you'll miss most of his stuff because it was only for books for the blind that he did the bulk of his work. But he read the entirety of the King James Bible. It used to be on records, then they finally put it on cassettes and CDs. Now you can get an MP3 file. And he can pronounce everything the correct English way. Right? 77 hours, I think it is. 77 or 72, I forget, 70 some odd hours total it takes him to read everything. For those who've listened, what have you learned as you listen to the Word of God being read? Do you hear things you've never heard? Do things pop and you go, wait a second? That's why we stay. Word of God. It's safe. It's safe. And so we go to a fundamental core group of doctrines for the first basis of safety. Ephesians 3. Ephesians 3. I mean Ephesians 4. There we go. Ephesians 4, 3 through 6. I have my numbers backwards. Nothing like mental numbers dyslexia in your Bible class. In Ephesians 4, 3 through 6. <coughs> Sister Kelly, if you've got that one. <coughs> Ephesians 4, 3 through 6. I said Kelly, but if Sally's got it, I'll, I'll give Kelly the next one or vice versa. Um, endeavoring to keep the unity of the Spirit, the bond of peace, there is one body and one Spirit, just as you were called in one hope of your calling. One Lord, one faith, one baptism. One God and Father of all, who is above all and through all and in you all. All right. This is the unity of the Spirit. These seven categories are actually subcategories under the larger category, the unity of the Spirit. But because how your Bible's punctuated, everybody goes, no, verse, verse 3, that's the end of a sentence. No. Verse 3 should have been a colon. And these next three verses should have been what came after that in, in English grammar. The unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace is one body. That body is what? In Ephesians, he's already defined a body for us. What is the body? The church. It says so back in chapter 1. Right? Verses 22 and 23. He put all things under his feet and gave him to be the head over all things to the church, which is his body. There's only one church. There's only one body. There's one spirit. There's not multiple spirits. There's one Holy Spirit who's working in and through that one church in every aspect of it. Just as you were called in one hope. One hope. He said, yeah, no, we'll look at these seven categories as part of it. There's no point in me doing an introduction if we don't look at what's the one hope. One Lord, who is the Lord? Who is the Lord in, in the New Testament? Jesus. Jesus. There is one Holy Spirit. There is one Lord, Jesus Christ. There's one faith. One faith. That means you can know what you're supposed to believe and why you're supposed to believe it. End of discussion. Why is it in almost anything else? For those who worked for the government, for those who worked for the federal government, Whenever they issued a new document, was that new document the binding document for everyone in that agency? Yes. Pre and, and frequently it'll say previous editions 
and it'll say something basically no longer valid, not to be used, blah, 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 blah. Because why? That manual, everyone knew that was the standard by which we're all playing now. Now, that generally holds true with most government agencies except the CDC for the last two and a half years. Okay? I'm not sure what they're doing. Okay? Building codes. Can you know if your homeowner, if your, if your home builder has built your home according to hurricane standards by international building codes? Yeah, even if you're not a contractor, it's easy. Here's the easiest way. You open your attic, you look at the picture in the building code for how all that stuff's supposed to be strapped and joined together. And if what you see doesn't look like the picture, you know what? You need to get a new contractor in there to fix it and you need to sue the old contractor to pay the new contractor. Why is it in everything else? Food should always be cooked and served at 114 degrees if it's a meat product. Now for those who've ever worked in food service, you know the answer to that is what? No. Don't ever cook and serve pork at less than 140 degrees. Chicken, till the core temperature of chicken reaches at least 180, it'll kill you. It'll kill you. Beef, make sure that as you're cooking your hamburgers, because your spouse or someone has not brought you a clean plate, just put it back on the blood plate before you carry it back in. After it's been sitting in the heat at 104 degrees, multiplying E. coli. Say, no, that's not how. Why is it in everything else in life, everybody can get it through their thick skulls? There's a right way and a wrong way. But when you come to the Bible and it says there's one faith, they go, well, we just don't know what God wants. <laughs> Do you realize every church that was ever written to, in the areas where they didn't know, they received instruction, and in the areas where they did know, they received correction? It's that simple. There's one faith. You know the only way there could have been one faith when Paul wrote that? was if everyone knew what that one faith, that one standard was in the church, period. Therefore, logically, you cannot have 75 different denominations that teach contradictory and they all be correct according to the Word of God. It doesn't work. It does not work. And so we look at what are some of the hallmarks of the one faith. One of the key ones is the next one. One baptism. There are about seven different baptisms in the New Testament. Only one baptism is valid for the church for all time until Jesus returns. Only one. It was the one he commanded, and it's the one the apostles engaged in in the book of Acts. And that is baptism in water in the name of Jesus for the remission of sins, for being added to his church, etc., etc., There's one God and Father. Generally, when New Testament speaks about God, it's generically speaking about the Father. But don't lose the fact that it's a conjunction there, God and Father, because Jesus is also called God in the New Testament. The Spirit is denoted as God. But what we see in these three verses is another great truth. There is the Spirit... There is the Lord and there is the Father. And, and if we have the opportunity when we look at those, I'll show you why we see that differentiation. It's given to us clearly in 1 Corinthians, the three different areas of how the church is actually supposed to function and be administered is why those three categories are there. And so that, but look at the rest of the phrasing. One God and Father of all, who is above all, through all, and in you all. But then back there in chapter 1, 22 and 23, right? Gave him be over all things, uh, 
put all things under his feet and gave him head over all things to the church, which is his body, the fullness of him who fills all in all. Jesus is all sufficient for our entire purpose and mission of the church in this life. And the Father is the one who is over all and through all and abiding in us. There is no separation within the Godhead from his people and in their functions. And so those are the first seven ones. The one faith, Jude 3. Kelly, Jude 3. I'll give you, give you. Always remember if you type in a Bible verse on like Bible Gateway or something like that on books like Jude and Philemon, you have to put a one and then a colon because the computer program can't read that it doesn't have a chapter and a verse. So Jude, it's just Jude 3. There is no chapter 1 to Jude. That's just freebie while we're turning there. Jude 3, Sister Kelly. Beloved, although I was very eager to write to you about our common salvation, I found it necessary also to write to you in order that you may be able to stand firm in the faith and the truth that is in Christ Jesus. Beloved, I beseech you to be zealous for the good work of the Lord. Our salvation is included in our faith. But our salvation is not the entirety of our faith. But notice that even in the first century, he tells them what? Contend for the faith, which was once for all delivered to the saints. Once for all. So that faith. And then 2 Corinthians 13, 5. Some of you are going to look at that and go, hey, I thought I saw this on Friday evening between the hours of 6 and 8 p.m. Some of you know what I'm talking about. Sandy, if you'll read 2 Corinthians 13, 5, please. Examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. Test yourselves. Do not know yourselves that Jesus Christ is in you unless indeed you are disqualified. How far did you say? Just verse 5. Okay. Examine yourselves as to whether you are in the faith. The word of God will tell you whether or not you're in the faith that Christ gave and that the apostles taught. There's no question about it. And a, a basics of the faith will answer certain things. But I want you to think about this with me. Let's, let's take the Lord's Supper. Where is the first place that the Lord's Supper is specifically taught in the New Testament? And I'll give you a hint. It's either in Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. Okay. Explicitly, its ordinance is in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. In John, John 6, Jesus teaches the spiritual aspects of it as the manna from heaven and the true blood. And then John 13, we catch a glimpse of what happened in the middle of it with Judas and the foot washing and all of that stuff. So Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, all four Gospels, right? <clears throat> Book of Acts. I read at least three very clear references in the Book of Acts to the observance of the early church and the Apostles' Doctrine and the Lord's Supper. 1 Corinthians, chapter 10 and chapter 11, very clearly about half of chapter 11 deals with it, referencing the exact wording of the Gospel of Luke, but with additional, okay, so, so we have that, um, we have a veiled reference in, kind of in 2 Corinthians, and the whole book of Revelation is an exposition of the great spiritual reality of the Lord's Supper and everything that we hold to. The whole book of Revelation is, is, is contained within the Lord's Supper. But then you go back to the Old Testament. What's the first reference in the Old Testament as far as prophetically foreshadowed of the Lord's Supper? Long before this dude ever had a kid, But you got the right, you got an A. 
<laughs> and A's on the right track. Who's the other big A? Abraham. Abraham at the tithing to Melchizedek. And he brought out bread and wine. Now isn't that an interesting thing? They had a fellowship that looked forward to what would be in Christ, and they also had the bringing of an offering at the same time. You know, we won't talk about the fact there's churches that won't take the Lord's Supper every week, but they never miss an offering. <laughs> they never miss a collection. But way back in Scripture, what? The fellowship and the giving, they go together. That's why it's edgy to say that this is the core of our worship. Because even as we, as we learn to understand our offering, what? Our offering is a reflection of what we do here. They're inseparable. It's the give and take between a God and his devotee, his worshiper, vice versa. What's our next major reference of this in Exodus? It's a P word. Passover. Exodus 12. And it's explicitly called the Passover, our Lord, in the Corinthian letter. <clears throat> Christ, our Passover, is sacrificed for us. And then we keep on going. Psalms, the crucifixion. Okay. So, core issue. Core issue. It's all over it. What about baptism? Can you name at least 15 things that happened to you when you were baptized in Christ by the Holy Spirit of the work that he did? Can you name at least 15 things that God did at that moment? They say, this is definitely a trick question. You should have sent out a text so we could have had a chance to put together a list. Okay? Okay? But now, the image of the water and the spirit goes back to Genesis 1. It goes back to the flood of Noah. It goes to the exodus of Egypt and Israel and the Red Sea. It looks forward and sees... In Naaman, it looks forward in the promises in Ezekiel. Then we have the baptism of Jesus in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. You realize the baptism and the crucifixion are explicit in all four? The Lord's Supper is in John, but it's not as explicit as it is in Matthew, Mark, and Luke. That the baptism of Jesus is in all four. The crucifixion. Where is baptism commanded in the Gospels? There's only one Gospel that doesn't command it explicitly. How about Matthew? Go into all the world, make disciples, right? Teach all nations, baptizing them. Mark, go all the world, preach the Gospel. Every creature that believes and is baptized shall be saved. John, except you are born again of water and of the Spirit, you cannot. And I love when people go, he's not talking about the water of baptism in physical water. That was a reference to the amniotic fluid in birth. Really, you clowns? Then how come if you keep reading, it says, and Jesus was baptizing and John was baptizing where they did. Why? Because there was much water there. Really? Seriously? Luke is the only one that doesn't explicitly command baptism. Luke 24 says that repentance and remission of his sins should begin in Jerusalem in his name. And then when you come over to Acts 2, guess what? Peter answered them and said, Repent and let each one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of your sins. Because Luke is volume 1, Acts is volume 2. And then almost every single instance of conversion in the book of Acts that is even referenced is connected to baptism explicitly stated. Romans, all of Romans chapter 6 is about baptism. Corinthians, 
The apostle says, for by one spirit you were all baptized into one body. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. Galatians. Unless you are baptized into Christ, you have not put on Christ. And then, if you haven't put on Christ, you don't belong to Christ. You don't have the seed of Abraham. You don't have the promise of Abraham. You're in trouble. Ephesians, we just looked at it. There's one baptism, but Ephesians 5 that we did not look at says what? That through the washing of water by the word, he has purified the church that he can present it to himself blameless. Colossians, by faith are you buried with him into baptism that just as Christ was, in Colossians 2.12, explicit again. Titus 3, it's called the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit. And then 1 Peter 3, 1 Peter 3, I don't really know how you can argue it. The like figure whereunto baptism does also now save you through the resurrection of Jesus Christ. Seems to me like baptism is like literally basically from the front to the back of the entirety of Scripture. And then Hebrews says that your hearts are sprinkled by the blood of Jesus, but your bodies are washed by pure water. Because why? Christ applying the blood on the mercy seat, that's the sprinkling he's talking about. But your bodies are washed by pure water. That's what happens in the physical. Oh, wait, that goes back to 1 John 5 on Wednesday night. The spirit, the water, and the blood bear witness in the earth, and these three agree. So, wait, 1 John picks it up, too. Baptism. I've had people tell me I teach too much about it. I'm sorry. As wide a scope as that baptism covers, I don't know. And the fact that Gospels record it as much as it does, even more than the Lord's Supper. Oh, wait. And if the Lord's Supper is tied to his crucifixion, his burial, and his resurrection, and the promise of his return, and baptism is tied to his death, his burial, and his resurrection, and the hope of what we're going for, because we've sowed a seed that we're waiting to be raised just like he was raised, that looks to me that it makes a holy triangle of baptism, the plan of his sacrifice, and the Lord's Supper, that you can't touch any one of those three legs and not abandon the basics of the faith. They are so interwoven. <clears throat> when you talk about one, you might as well talk about the other because there is no way to escape it. Women. Should we talk about the roles of women in the church in a basics of the faith class? Some people know, brother. Should we talk about roles of men in the church in the basics of the faith class? No, brother. Except to say the men pray and the women do what they're told. Right? Hadn't that been the general line for a long time? Tell the women they can clean the building, prepare communion, and teach the little kids. What a shame. I see women all over the New Testament. I see some of them called out by name that they were the big money supporters of Jesus' ministry. I love when people like, Jesus' ministry was poor. How many of you have an accountant because you have no money? And I'll tie this back to the women in just a second. Do you know how much money Jesus' ministry must have had that the apostles didn't think anything about Judas going out at midnight to find someone to just do charity to at midnight? And that it was such a common thing that nobody was like, where are you going, Judas, with the money bag? No one asked him. They're like, oh, he's probably going out to do some more benevolence again. They didn't know he was going to betray him. They all thought he was going to do benevolence. Someone, but brother Jesus didn't have money to pay the tax. Because who was he with? Just Peter. Was Peter the treasurer of Jesus's, Jesus Ministries International? No. Peter was press secretary, shoot his mouth off, and have to apologize for it. 
of Jesus Ministries International. James and John, they were the ministers of war. Let us call down fire from heaven and kill everyone. <laughs> All right, sons of thunder. No, we're not doing that plan today. Jesus ministry had plenty of money. Judas wasn't there when Peter and Jesus were fixing to walk in, so Jesus says, go get a fish, the exact money we need to pacify these people so we go about our business. That's the exact amount that will be in the fish's mouth. Who thinks there was lack in the ministry of Jesus? If you could tell someone, go drop a hook, and the first fish up has the exact amount to satisfy these people so they'll leave us alone and get off our backs so we can do what's important. That's not lack. That's called abundant provision. But his day-to-day -day ministry, Chusa, the wife of Herod's chief steward, for those who liked Downton Abbey, at least the first season. I tried to watch into the second season. I couldn't. But I did watch all of the first season. I thought the first season was phenomenal. So you watch Downton Abbey the first season. You understand the chief steward of a king or a lord of a manor, the only other person in the house that can say anything opposite to him other than the master is the wife of the master. There's the master of the house, the master's wife, and the chief steward. So in politics, there's the president and the secretary of state. <clears throat> A chief butler, when you read that, that Cusa's, you know, Cusa's wife, Cusa was the, the head, the, the chief steward, read Herod's secretary of state. Nobody got near him, nobody got access, nobody, <clears throat> nothing came to Herod except it went through him. Herod's right-hand guy's wife was a big financial supporter of the work of Jesus, along with a few others that are mentioned there. I think it probably would behoove us, if not during a Fundamentals of the Faith class, but to look at what was the role of women in the ancient church, what was the role of men, and get back to what does the Bible actually teach about both of these categories. Because how long have there been troubles between men and women? As soon as Adam ate that apple, or whatever it was, because most apples come from Washington State, and Washington State is filled with liberalism, we'll assume it was an apple, that must be why they have so many problems there. No, that logic doesn't work. But whatever it was. And when he ate, it says what? Then were both their eyes opened. Then were they both ashamed. Then they both hid and covered themselves. Not just from God, but from each other. And then he blamed God and he blamed the woman. I'll everybody. He blamed the woman. No, he didn't. The woman you gave me, she did it. Oh, man, that was some slick politics. Adam says, it's your fault and her fault. I was just there for a snack. Eve, the serpent. So in that moment, husbands and wives were ready to throw each other under the bus. So apparently, how long? Ever since the first sin. So we probably should talk about those things. And let the scripture tell us what we need to know, not what popular culture wants to try and inject into the church to divide the children of God even more. What else? Why do we worship the way we worship? <coughs> what did the apostles do as they left the upper room and went down to the Mount of Olives? Well, they left the upper room, went down, and then went back up onto the Mount of Olives. What does it say that they did? Sang they sang a hymn. I've listened to every dumb argument that I think can be had on this. Well, the ministry of Jesus, they didn't. If Jesus would have wanted some little liar players, <laughs> could they have brought liars into the upper room and then played liars as they walked out to the Mount of Olives? 
Why is there no record of Jesus ever doing anything other than singing for his musical stuff? Why is it that every reference is singing in the New Testament? All the commands are to sing. Why is it that for the first thousand years of church history, when everybody who knew Greek was able to hold the line against the Roman Catholics who became the first denomination, it was, always remember this, it was the Roman church that left everyone else. And as soon as they left, the two things they changed right out of the gate. They went to infant baptism and instrumental music and worship. Those were the first two major deviations that they did. Why is it every major reformer, the first thing they said was get the instrument out of the church. It's from the devil. Latin officially, they weren't able to enforce that fully until after the split. But the language had been Latin for a long time because that was the only universal language in Western Europe. And then after everything finally fell, what? Latin became the language of enslavement. You know? But yeah, that's so a lot of different things to look at, to consider with one goal and here's the goal it should move us towards being the church that Jesus built with his apostles and through his apostles because the apostolic church is the one that Jesus built and if we don't look like it we've got a problem because then we're not the church that he intended so glad to have you here this morning